are in session 5 today and uh, we will deep dive into the .NET Framework internals and today we'll see internals of .NET application execution and the common language infrastructure. Once again we'll review uh, one step down into the CLI and the managed assembly, how we, uh, we'll get into the details of managed assemblies and assembler and disassembler, we'll see what are the tools we have and uh, ILDASM, we will again walk through the, some of the detailed internals of the ILDASM and also we'll look into the code obfuscation and uh, JIT compilers, we'll see what they are the code verification process, or how the .NET applications ex uh, do the code verification and the what is an unsafe code, we'll see with a demo and also the PE Verify tool, we will jump deep dive into the why and uh, in what scenarios we can use the PE Verify tool. And also we'll see an overview of the app domain and what it stands for in the world of uh, .NET Framework. Okay? So this is a pretty interesting topic again and uh, we will revisit the uh, the introductory topics that we had in the first session. So we have seen the, we have covered the CLI which is the common language infrastructure wherein um, we have seen you can write the C-sharp code and C-sharp code has its own compiler and VB.NET code has its own compiler VBC and C-sharp has C, uh, CSC and J sharp code has its own compiler and so on I can have my own language for just a demo purpose there is nothing called uh, APK sharp uh, in the real market now I'm just uh, naming my own language for example uh, Aripaka sharp code just an, an example so there is nothing called APK sharp in the market okay not yet might come in the future but not yet so I can have my own language created uh, and also have my own compiler and let my compiler spit out the MSIL which is the uh, Microsoft uh, Intermediate Language. So MSIL uh, follows these standards called the CLS and CTS. We have seen what is a CLS and what is CTS. Uh, with the code examples and walking through the uh, MSIL, um, how it's going to represent. So the various code uh, languages are communicated to the CLR is a one language which is MSIL. So we have seen this uh, in the earlier sessions and we will uh, go deeper into what will happen at the CLR stage. So the CLR is going to uh, convert the MSIL into the machine level instructions at the time of execution. Okay, so that's what we have covered in the previous uh, introductory sessions. As we know, we have seen what is a managed code. Okay, so CLR can understand only the managed code which is the MSIL. So this is a, a basic structure of an assembly we have seen using the IL disassembler wherein the managed code has a two parts of it which is a metadata and MSIL. So metadata uh, is going to be uh, inside the manifest of the um, assembly. We have seen the demo in the previous sessions wherein after upon double clicking the uh, manifest in the IRDS, we will see that today again. So just uh, to have a, a quick overview. So metadata and MSIL uh, combine to become an assembly. So metadata will have the information about the assembly and the MSIL is the uh, core uh, instructions that need to be executed which is pretty much your code body of the MSIL or code body of the assembly sorry okay so this is pretty vanilla flavor no confusion on this okay so you're clear and now um, we have two interesting tools uh, one of them we have seen already uh, ILDASM um, uh, for the benefit of uh, everyone else, uh, I can't stop opening it. So what I'm going to do is um, 
ILDASM. So this is the tool which is called an intermediate language disassembler. Using this, I can actually view the content of a compiled uh, code. So if I take an example of uh, my first library, so I'm going to open the content of the compiled uh, uh, assembly. So this is the, my first DLL. So if you see, this is the two aspects of the assembly, which is the manifest and the MSIL. So this is nothing but the MSIL, which is grouped as the namespace. Within this, this is the basic instructions the, that are laid out. And get me that, if you see, this is the MSIL instructions uh, that are uh, available uh, in terms of MSI, if you see, IL stands for Intermediate Language. So this is what we have in the slide. So ILDASM is an interesting tool wherein I can actually see the intermediate language uh, with a naked eye. So most of the EXEs, if you see in the uh, other languages, you cannot open and see them because they are completely a binary instructions. Um, and uh, they cannot be a human readable. Uh, but .NET code is a, uh, MSIL is a human readable and the CLR can understand these instructions and translate it to the um, uh, machine language, machine code during execution. So one of the other tool we haven't seen is the uh, assembler, which is an intermediate language assembler. This is quite opposite to the uh, ILASM which is used to create the assembly okay so when you actually do a compiling a code what I'm doing is uh, in the IDE I'm actually go to build and as a build solution so it's actually built and build successful so what's what IDE is using so again the point back is do you really need IDE to run the uh, code and uh, compile a .NET program? I said not necessarily because IDE is a user friendly tool wherein you can actually develop the uh, applications uh, in a rapid way. So you can still actually write the same code. This is, if you see this is a code is a plain text. I can put it in the notepad and I can use a compiler and compile it. So the respect to compiler, once it compiles the code to MSIL, it's going to use the uh, uh, assembler to assemble the MSIL with the metadata and create the assembly. Okay, so the assembler is the one which is going to create the assembly, and IL uh, disassembler is going to be uh, used to read the. Uh, intermediate language instructions. Okay, so why do you really need these tools to the first place? Okay, so why do you need these tools? Because uh, you need these for uh, analyzing the code. Uh, if you remember, uh, we are at a very high level programmer, programming language. We are using a high level programming language which are pretty much a human readable code and you can write them uh, with ease. Uh, if you compare to the older languages, which were actually in assembly level languages, uh, wherein it takes uh, years or months to write a small program. Okay, so right now we are in a rapid application uh, phase where you can write a, a human readable uh, or easy understandable language uh, in an easy way and rapid way. So people out there, uh, a couple of very mission critical applications uh, want to uh, control the uh, the uh, MSIL at the assembly level, you can actually go and write your own uh, assembly level language uh, if you are really familiar how the uh, CLS and CTS work. So CLS is completely a language specifications as we have seen it uh, every instruction um, this is what the slide we are seeing. So if this is what an MSIL looks like and if you see the every instructions uh, have a meaning, so you can actually go and write an MS uh, intermediate language at, at assembly level 
and uh, use um, your assembler which is ILASM to create the assembly. So if you see it's completely going to be outside your Visual Studio you can wherein you can actually go and write the IL instructions directly and use the uh, IL ASM to assemble your uh, intermediate language and the manifest to create an assembly which can be executed by the CLR. So it's completely outside the Visual Studio. So clear? Uh, that's the use of an IL ASM and IL DASM. So if you come back to the question like practical approach, right? If you will, uh, will anyone ask you to use these tools or write the IL instructions or even understand each of these instructions in real time world? No. Nobody will ask you to do this. Okay. This information is uh, FYI and to understand how the language interoperability happens and how, how the um, IL looks like and wh what is a tool you can use even if you want to see the, how the instructions are. So sometimes uh, in my practi practical scenario, ILDASM is really made useful in one of the scenario here for me in one of the project. Uh, uh, how? Because uh, we have seen that uh, we have a very big project uh, and it has about 35 assemblies or uh, projects referred to it and uh, the, we have seen the size of the, uh, the assembly was completely uh, out of range uh, which was showing around the 25 MB size. So 25 MB size of assembly out of even if it is 35 um, uh, projects shouldn't be because 25 MB is a very huge uh, code and uh, because the assembly size is so big uh, it's actually slowing down the build process and also the runtime process. So I wanted to see what exactly, why exactly the size of the assembly is increasing, increase so drastically. So I used the ILDASM tool to analyze what's, uh, what's missing. So surprise to me, I have seen it has actually added a couple of files uh, which are supposed to be uh, not part of the assembly. Like for example, we have a couple of uh, standalone PDF files and also a couple of uh, other uh, image files which are supposed to be a resource files and they shouldn't be part of the uh, build. So they were actually by mistake uh, their build action was set to be compiled. So when you when this was set, uh, what happened was all those files which are not supposed to be part of the build, they were added to the assembly. So that caused the size of the assembly to be so big. So that's how you can actually make use of the uh, ILDASM tool. So this is a very useful tool to get into the S compile assembly and see what is wrong if at all you want to see. Okay. So uh, and also uh, ILDASM you might not use it in a normal scenarios. So if you if you're going to go get into more advanced .NET programming then you really makes help you how you can use these tools. Okay. So let's continue. So now the big problem with the way ILDASM does its job. If you see, I am an expert. Okay, consider, consider I am an expert and I know what are these instructions all about and also uh, as a matter of fact there are tools out in the market which I can, of course it's pretty much you know as long as you know these statements mean this then you saw anyone can write a program that can actually reverse engineer this language into the real algorithm. So it is another, in, a, in simple terms, when you can convert this human readable code to this, I can also reverse engineer this to this, right? Straightforward, simple. So this, because this is not a uh, binary uh, language, this is completely a human readable language. Uh, even if you sit for a couple of weeks, you can actually write a code that can that you can reverse engineer back to the original algorithm. So what this means is, when I distribute my compiled assembly to a third party, 
So if my code is complex uh, and has a trade secrets of algorithm, even in today world, Google search engine is the most uh, popular because it is faster and they have their own algorithm implemented. So there are so many other search engines in the market which are not so popular because they're, they either don't give you results what you are looking for or they are very slow like uh, altavista.com is one of those old search engine and the recent term uh, blink and also you have a uh, name any so there are plenty plenty of yahoo has its own search engine again so so on so there is a trade secret of uh, algorithm involved how you write your code uh, that becomes more uh, popular and usable in the market so if that kind of algorithm is no more a secret then you are at a risk. So that becomes a problem of uh, having an I, uh, your uh, MSIL distributed to the third parties uh, as a distributable code and someone who have access to it can reverse engineer and steal your algorithm. So that becomes a major threat. So how to uh, mitigate this problem? So if you see uh, the um, uh, ILD disassembler, how it works, it's pretty much what we discussed just now. Uh, the source code get compiled to a easy to decompile MSIL, which can be CLR can run on that. So I can use an obfuscation, it's called an obfuscate using uh, Visual Studio and similar uh, faster obfuscated MSIL and CLR can run. So the code obfuscation is a process in which you will uh, make sure that no one can reverse engineer your MSIL. Uh, how are you going to do? There, there are several obfuscation tools available in the market uh, and uh, I have a list of those tools available in the market uh, which are pretty much a third party tools and several vendors have their own versions of uh, obfuscation in the market and a couple of them are from Redgate and also from Microsoft. Uh, 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 Dogfuscation tools. So these tools uh, pretty much uh, r uh, you run on the MSIL. The obfuscation tools uh, using Visual Studio as a plugin, uh, they can convert uh, your MSIL to a much smaller and faster obfuscated MSIL, which will take away the information. Uh, that uh, is normally not required by the CLR. So they pretty much don't manipulate the entire MSIL code, but they carefully uh, erase a couple of information which uh, which cannot be read by any uh, disassembler tools. Uh, if you run the obfuscation tool and run the ILDS DASM on that, so you, you will not be successfully uh, open the code and uh, show you the way we have seen. So obfuscation is a security um, measure which is added as an third as an add-on uh, to protect the trade secrets or intellectual property of the company. So this is created. So probably this is a new keyword. Keep in mind that this is a process in which you protect the intellectual property of the company wherein the MSIL code is is crumbled. In other words, these utilities crumble the names of all private symbols in your managed module metadata, not the MSIL. So the metadata is going to be scrambled, but not the IL code. Why? Because IL code is the machine instructions that are gone to the uh, CLR. Uh, wherein it's going to translate that instructions to the machine level. If you if you tamper that instruction, then the CLR your program itself can not work. So you don't touch the uh, IL code and you will scramble the metadata. So this is an outline of uh, how the uh, obfuscation tools work uh, and every uh, vendor out there have their own different algorithms. Uh, uh, one might claim as a better over the other based on the various scenarios. So we're not getting into more detail of, uh, of all of that. So the most popular of them is the uh, .fuscator, uh, .net obfuscator. So .fuscator, so all these tools actually provide the uh, 
plugins to the Visual Studio and uh, this is the link uh, uh, I have given so I can share it probably as a separate thing so this will provide a list of uh, third-party tools uh, that are available for Shisha programming and of them uh, obfuscation is one of them so there are various other categories of tools available uh, which are going to be anyway useful at this stage of training so they might um, you better get into that uh, tools list only when we finish the training and uh, you are ready for the advanced uh, topics uh, because uh, if you get into that list now so it might create more confusions and more worries so uh, so at this stage don't worry about that so obfuscation is a process to uh, scramble the MSIL to protect the intellectual property of your code or intellectual property is nothing but the your logical logics or algorithm that you have implemented in your code okay next come the just in time so this is the very heart of the CLR so CLR if you see the um, so we have the MSIL we have seen how the MSIL is created uh, using the uh, assembler which is ILASM and the SM, uh, MSIL is what going to be executed by the CLR so and we have seen the outline that MSIL comes into CLR and CLR is going to make it to native CPU instructions so we will get into how the CLR does the compilation of a JIT using JIT so CLR make use of a JIT compiler which is called a just-in-time compiler to convert to compile the MSIL into native code so during that process it has a two important phases uh, the first phase it gets into is the code verification and then when it passes the code verification it does the compile okay so uh, to keep this session simple I actually uh, skipped a couple of other steps which comes intermediate or before the uh, JIT, in, JIT comes into picture so which we have discussed in the CAS which is code access security wherein CLR going to check the assembly level uh, security permissions uh, uh, before it's going to call the JIT okay so that I am, didn't cover it uh, because I want to keep this simple for today's session uh, so uh, so uh, even though it's not uh, shown in this picture um, so CIS comes before the JIT wherein the CLR going to uh, check the permissions that are required to execute the assembly to the machine security policy and make sure it has the required policies and permissions and then it's going to load it and perform uh, call the JIT compiler so uh, what is code verification and what is the compile process we'll see down the line so we'll um, so the IL instructions cannot be executed directly by a today's CPUs and we have seen that because that's the reason and another thing is today's CPUs is a good point there although it might change someday because uh, CLR is again a separate uh, 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 process that run that sits on the operating system tomorrow if CLR becomes a part of the operating system so you you don't need uh, you know CLR as a separate installation uh, uh, to be uh, added <laughs> although today the all the Windows operating systems uh, have the CLR as an integral component uh, but if it is part of the operating system because even today someone have to convert the uh, MSIL to the machine instructions uh, only when the machine can understand the operating system can execute it so IL cannot be executed directly by the operating system so that's the key point and in order to execute a method its IL code must first be converted to native CPU instructions to make this conversion the CLR provides a JIT compiler or simply it's called as a jitter okay that's the overview of a JIT if you remember if you're if you have some overview of Java compilers Java also pretty much same way it does so only difference is that Java has an object code versus whereas the dotnet has a MSIL 
um, but uh, there are slightly or uh, differences between the uh, .NET MSIL and the uh, Java specific object code uh, wherein uh, uh, the obfuscation stuff is little different than uh, this. Of course, that's again uh, proprietary trademarks of how people handle things, but at a high level view, uh, it's all same. So Java compiler compiles the Java code to object code and the uh, the runtime of Java in, uh, execution engine is going to use the uh, Java JIT compiler to convert the object code to the machine instructions before execution. So that is same even in Java and it's same in .NET. So JIT compiler is a .NET specific uh, compiler which, which translates the MSIL to the machine level code. So now, so far we have seen that CLR understand the MSIL. We have been using the statement called CLR understand the MSIL. So when I get one step deep into CLR, now I say actually JIT compiler knows the MSIL, not the CLR. Okay, so we get one step into the uh, system. So CLR manages the JIT compiler, in other words. So CLR will uh, call the JIT compiler whenever uh, it thinks it needs to. So when it needs to call JIT compiler, when it need not, this diagram shows. So the figure below shows uh, what happens the first time the method is called. Okay. Um, so again, so this uh, is a, a very rough uh, diagram. Um, just wanted to give you uh, some high level overview. So there is a lot before this stage comes into play and even within this player stage there are a couple of other uh, intricacies that we don't want to show here and complicate it. So I just wanted to keep it simple. So we have a managed exe in this case. We have seen the console.write line, hello world and goodbyes. We, this is a plain uh, hello world example we have seen. So what will happen here? So this is a managed assembly. In other words, this is self-executable exe file. So when the first time this uh, assembly is loaded, consider the CA, it passed the CAS, which is code access security, and then uh, the CLR loaded this assembly into its memory and then started execution. So the for console programs, every program has an entry point to it. So you know that we have a thousand lines of code. I have a two thousand lines of code. So some programs have million lines of code. But okay, so from where are you going to start execution? Well, that's the fundamental question. So that fundamental question uh, it will be answered in the uh, metadata itself. The metadata will also have an entry point, so which I am not showing in this diagram. Uh, but there are a couple of uh, keywords uh, that usually map to uh, to the program and uh, they will not change. For example, app.config is a standard name which your runtime is going to look for, for configurations. Okay, similarly, um, similarly, if you see the static void main is the entry point to the application. So why this is entry point? So what will happen if, if I change the uh, name of the public stat uh, the static void main? We'll see that in simple. So to just to demonstrate, <coughs> Uh, what if what will happen if I change the name of the static void main? Okay, I'll make it as a one, as simple as one, and I compile the program. Okay, so immediately my compiler said, "Do not contain the static void main." If you see, the does not uh, the exe does not contain a static main method suitable for an entry point. So this indicates that my program name, uh, the entry point name is predefined. So I cannot have a program without public static void main for a console applications. Okay, and similarly, there is an entry point for web applications, and there is an entry point for uh, Windows applications. So for Windows applications, uh, it's a form, the first form. You say the it's going to create instance of that form uh, will be the entry point. Uh, uh, if you open this, uh, if you see, this is the startup form. So Windows applications, uh, form one 
you should have one of the form listed as a startup form. Okay, and similarly for console application, uh, it's a mandatory to have an entry point. Uh, by default, the entry point is a public static void main. And why it is public, what is public, what is static, what is void, don't worry. So that's part of the access modifiers which uh, we're going to discuss tomorrow. Okay, so don't worry about that. For now, the entry point is what we're talking. Okay, so it locates the entry point uh, either from the metadata or based on the application um, and uh, then it, and it decides to start uh, entering into that particular line of code. So it found the main method here. So main block, the entire block it is going to uh, send for compilation. So if you see the open bracelets and end bracelets so these define the block of code and also these define the scope of the method so within which the variable creation this uh, and their auto scope uh, unreachable other things will happen which we have seen the on the other session so for now this block will be loaded into the uh, execution execution cycle so the first step it's going to happen is going to send it to JIT compiler. Um, the block is going to get into the JIT compiler and the uh, JIT compiler is going to start compiling each of the line into the machine level instructions and so JIT compiler comes into the MS Core EE.DLL which is the Microsoft Core Execution Engine. So I have been saying execution engine, execution engine so many times and this is the uh, assembly that is the main core engine that executes or compiles uh, the code to the native code. So which is the JIT compiler is actually going to invoke uh, MS Core EE. So what MS Core EE is going to do? So JIT compi compiler function, so it's can pretty much call the JIT compilers function uh, uh, in the assembly that implements the type console look up uh, the method right line being called in the metadata. So it's going to look up for, if you have seen the metadata I'll open quickly again to see um, if you see the right line instruction here it's actually referring to the assembly that it needs to use to check the respective member okay so it's actually have the instruction MS core lib here See, similarly if I use any other uh, assembly so the uh, MSL instructions will say okay use this and look at this and do this okay so that's the level of feed it's going to have so that's why uh, it's going to look up into that uh, particular assembly it's going to read that assembly at runtime load that assembly and uh, uh, get that instruction from there and it will start doing it so what will happen if the respective assembly is not deployed or not available in the bin folder so it's going to break at the runtime okay so at the compile time you know so this is one of the typical scenarios uh, wherein the your application deployed to a production and uh, it start throwing a runtime exception and one of the most common exception is it cannot able to locate the dependent assembly which has been referred in the project okay so what will happen so for now if I say in this application I have referred my first library okay in my first library so I have a say a lo uh, one of the property called uh, copy local which I said true so this indicates whether the refer reference will be copied to the output directory. The output directory is nothing but the bin folder which we have seen, right? So by mistake, if I don't uh, put it true and I make it false, so what will happen? It's going to compile in my IDE, but it's not going to uh, take the copy of this into the bin folder. So you're going to actually pretty much as part of the deployment we have seen, we pretty much do an X copy of what we have in the respective folder in the bin. So you don't have a copy of the library here, but you deployed it without it. So 
it's fine it ran good in my local it perfectly works fine so it doesn't work anymore in the deployed environment where it doesn't find my first library so how that's going to happen that's because of the instruction wherein digit compiler whenever it comes it's going to look up for the respective assembly that is referred in the MSIL so it's going to say refer to this so it try to load it from the bin folder only bin folder it doesn't look anywhere else it looks only in the bin folder uh, or uh, the root uh, folder where your exe is executing so in other words like right, bin folder is a mandatory, mandatory folder for a web applications for windows applications it isn't okay it is not a mandatory folder but you will see the bin folder but we have discussed when we deploy you will deploy the content of the bin folder not the bin folder okay so when we deploy the content of the bin folder you will not have a bin folder but the content is moved to any other folder which is a deployed application so it's going to look up in the root where the application started execution so the respective dependent dll should be available in that root so if it is not there then it's going to fail right at the runtime okay so that's pretty much clear so it tries to locate the referred assembly so that applies even for the system assemblies which is your ms core lib we have seen the ms core lib example because ms core lib is not a user defined one it is a system defined one wherein the respective system or string and other thing basic language features are available so that is uh, uh, referred even though you don't refer explicitly in the code so it locates the respective assembly and then uh, then from the metadata get the il for this method it's going to get the uh, uh, il of that method method from the respective assembly metadata uh, from the respective assembly and then allocate a block of memory so it got the uh, IL and then it's going to allocate a block of memory because once it reads the IL code it knows how much space it needs to allocate for that block to uh, be located in the memory so it's going to allocate a block of memory first and then compile the IL to native CPU instructions and it's going to place the compiled uh, CPU instructions in the uh, memory uh, that it has allocated for that and if you know every memory has an address okay so the address in the memory we have discussed in the garbage collection in detail uh, when we move the address of uh, object to another uh, in, uh, to a new address so on so when the address is available um, it's going to move uh, put the compiled uh, code a uh, compiled instructions or machine level instructions into that address and uh, jump to the uh, and modify the methods entry point types table so there's something called a types table for the method so if you see the uh, uh, objects uh, uh, the public members or every method that it, you have in a, uh, in a class has its own address table uh, in the uh, in your instructions when it is loaded into the memory it's going to have a address for each of these members in pretty much as we said when I said uh, it loads the DLL into the memory so that's the memory which is the process area so in the process area it's going to load the assembly with for every assembly what it means it's going to map a uh, address where it's going to put each and every uh, method so it's it's going to have a, a predefined address area where the uh, your compiled code is loaded so that address is what it um, gets to compile and then once it, it allocates a new memory at that stage and then put the compiled one into the new memory area so at a given time when a program is running you will have both at this time uh, at this stage you will have the MSIL in the memory at one address and the compiled native code once it is compiled in a new address so what is interested here is the compiled code so the first time when it loads it will have only one address uh, in the memory uh, which is for the MSIL code and once a JIT compiler compiles it it's going to have a new address which is the compiled code 
So the next time when uh, it's try to refer, it's going to refer directly to the uh, the compiled code rather than the MSL code. So if there is no reference in the types table, then it's going to call the MSL or the JIT compiler to compile it. Otherwise, it will jump directly to the native code containing inside the memory block. So hope you're clear now. So JIT compiler comes into play. It did the compilation, translated the, it located the assembly, the related assembly first, and then uh, got the IL instruction from the assembly and uh, converted that intermediate language code to the machine level instructions and then placed the compiled CPU instructions into new address at stage 3. And that new address uh, is updated back to the tables type uh, types table wherein the original pointing was to the MSL code. Now the, it points to the uh, compiled code. So it's clear. Uh, if you're not clear, if it is more confusing, let me know. We'll uh, rediscuss this in a in a in a different way. And now we have a native CPU instructions for console public static void main. This is just referring to one of the line. Okay. So JIT compiler is going to take each of the line at a time and it's going to start compiling. And each of the line again within the same method. So remember one thing. So if you have a uh, uh, 10 different methods in your code, in your entire code, CLR is not going to compile all the 10 methods in the first time itself. It's going to compile the respective blocks which are visited in the execution process. Okay, so if you have two methods and you reach, you, you're conditionally you're going to reach one of the block uh, in other words, if I see here, I have two methods here, okay? Uh, say for example, this is a different method, pointer demo, and this is a different method. And what if I have a conditional statement here? If this condition, then do this, else do this. So what happens is, whichever code is uh, reached, that particular block, it's going to compile at the runtime and execute it. So if at all it is not compiled before, okay? So that's why it, it is named as a just-in-time. So just-in-time, the name itself goes there. So whichever block at runtime is visited, that time it will load that particular line of code, a block of code. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a block of code. It's going to load this whole block into memory translate each and every instructions and put this entire uh, compiled uh, code into a one memory location and updates that memory location to the uh, its uh, types table to the type table of my first library okay so this is a class itself or this is a namespace sorry so class one uh, class has its own type library wherein uh, right now before compilation it has its own address say number 10 is the address and once it is compiled, it has a new address called 11. So 11 address location contains the compiled instructions and the address location of 10 will have the MSL code, which is a raw code. So hope that is clear. So the respect to other method, uh, which uh, is here, else part, this will not get compiled unless until that is visited in your runtime. Okay, because my conditionally it's not visited, it will not compile that block. So this way, if you see the compilation process, uh, if it start compiling the entire program, when you double click the exe, it's going to take uh, a quite some time for your application to show up. So to avoid that, uh, it's going to optimally do the just-in-time compilation so that it will first time when it loaded it's going to the entry point is public static void main so it's going to just load this block and compile it and whenever the respective um, member comes that respective block is going to be compiled at us uh, whenever it is visited so straight away so it is going to be doing a just-in-time compilation uh, whenever it is visited and that's where the name is. 
So this is what uh, the next slide shows. When the second time uh, the entry point comes back to the same method, it's not going to do the same thing again because the entry point uh, for that method is already updated in step uh, 5 here, modifies the methods entry point uh, in the types table uh, to the compiled native code. So it's going to straight away uh, look up for the native code and uh, uh, push it to the, ma uh, the the marshaling. It just marshals to the respective operating system process area to execute the instructions. So that's how the JIT compiler uh, comes into play. Hope this is pretty much uh, clear. And uh, yeah, this talks about the same thing which we have discussed. Uh, the process incurs a performance hit only the first time. So the first time when it compiles, it will be a slightly delayed. The subsequent uh, hits will uh, reduce the uh, latency, which is uh, the performance uh, is going to be much better uh, when you keep running the code because uh, it cached the compiled uh, code into the memory. Okay, see so the compiled code again discarded when the application terminates. So that's another interesting thing. So you ran the application and you terminated the application by closing the window or exit the application. So the entire memory, which is the entire process area of the respective application itself is taken away from your process list. So in your stack view, if you see the process is gone. So that means everything else is gone. So whenever you rerun the application, it's going to do the same thing again. So um, uh, for that's uh, if you look at the um, web application, especially this is a very interesting phenomena in the web applications, um, especially the ASP dot and web applications, because Windows applications are going to run to the client side, um, which is uh, again notice, noticeably they'll see when they run the application for the first time, they'll see a slight delay. Uh, but soon after they start using it, um, uh, the same features in the application, they will tend to respond quicker uh, than the new uh, features that are not visited so far. But with web applications, it's pretty much uh, a scenario where in the respective page, whenever they got, uh, they received the request, will be loaded into the memory whenever it is visited for the first time. So the first time when a page loads uh, or requested, it's going to be delayed uh, considerably. And uh, uh, to mitigate that problem, uh, um, there are new features in .NET 4.0 wherein you can actually um, pre-process or pre-compile them and load it into the memory whenever you deploy the application to the production environment so that the the users who first hit the web application, they don't notice the uh, delay. Um, otherwise, in normal scenarios, uh, uh, you will see the delay for the first time you hit the page and subsequent hits to the same page will be much faster. Okay, so saying that, um, now comes the code verification. Um, so, uh, in other words, uh, code ver verification is done be before the uh, CA, uh, your, um, before your JIT compiler comes into play. So, the code, uh, I, I've just put the slides uh, other way around, but uh, otherwise code verification should come first, uh, as we have seen in the first slide, wherein the code verification comes first and then compilation, okay? Okay, what does happen in the code verification? This is a very, 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 very important and interesting thing. Uh, and this uh, aspect actually made managed applications more robust than any other applications. So, so remember, code access security is different from code verification. Code access security is completely um, at the code level, which what the code is trying to do and does the code has the required permissions to execute that kind of statements. For example, file operation systems or accessing a memory area directly, things memory management kind of activities. So uh, it's the, a policy related, a security policy related uh, topic which comes prior code verification or JIT compiler. Okay, so code verification is a verification that is done on the 
uh, intermediate language itself. And the CPU, uh, so if you see, I have been saying um, that um, in the first slide, one of the first slides says uh, I have my own language and I have my own compiler and I emit MSIL and do it. Okay, so this is okay, pretty straightforward. So when I start really coding, right, when I start really coding, okay, I wrote, for example, today's world, I wrote a C sharp code and I have a C sharp compiler which tells me what is wrong in my code. Okay, but I am going to write my own compiler. So how can I rely uh, or in other words, who will tell me that the, my compiler uh, written the correct MSIL code? Okay, so the bottom line is you need to know, you need to write the MSIL code absolutely correct way without any errors so that your CLR can run it at the runtime. So who will determine that uh, because I have my own uh, language here and I need to translate that language into the MSIL code. So who will do that? Uh, that's part of the MS, uh, that's part of the code verification. So there is a tool called, uh, we'll see in the next slide, which you can use to verify that your MSIL is valid or not. So how it determines the validity and what it may, this leads to a point called a safe code and unsafe code. And uh, to my memory, I have a, I have a question asked by one of you in one of my first sessions asking what is the difference between an unsafe code and unmanaged code. Okay, so this is more uh, in detail of what is unsafe code. And uh, with this uh, detail, uh, we can easily differentiate between what is an unsafe code and what is an unmanaged code. Okay, you might get a little confused because unsafe code is also a managed code, in other words. Okay, but only that unsafe code is trying to do things which are not supposed to be done by a managed code. But uh, your unmanaged code is a completely a different thing. Un unmanaged code is completely a non-MSIL code, which CLR uh, cannot run them, which are executed or running on a separate process area by the respective runtime. For example, COM. COM is a, a typical example of a uh, unmanaged code. Okay, and here we are still talking about the managed code. Safe and unsafe code are both are managed code. So how the verification process determine which is safe code and which is an unsafe, unsafe code. Okay, so safe code is pretty much a straight away um, code which does the all the normal operations. Um, and in other words, unsafe code is determined uh, the code that tries to uh, access uh, a couple of uh, uh, areas that it shouldn't be uh, accessed directly. Uh, for example, the memory area. So the memory management is completely within the control of the CLR using the garbage collection. So GC is of course solely responsible to manage the, uh, the address of the memory where this value need to be stored. So you don't manage where this value to be stored. So if you start uh, instructing uh, to, this, uh, to the runtime that, okay, uh, you're going to save this value to this address, not any other address, okay? So in other words, uh, if you're dealing with a COM component which is running on a different process area, uh, or even as a matter of fact, your own Windows operating system. So Windows operating system uh, has a lot of APIs that you can leverage. And all of those APIs run on the Windows operating system itself. Uh, a simple example is, um, so Windows manages your taskbar here and also your desktop. And also as a matter of fact, it manages uh, uh, many things like the, your a form uh, a title bar or menu bar or even the start button if you see here or the calculator for example or the paintbrush 
Uh, so there are so many uh, tools that win uh, Windows can uh, manage and also uh, to go at the graphics level at the DirectX implementation. So how it is showing this bar, if you see, there is a set of instructions uh, you passed on to the operating system. Okay, in, in simple words, um, if in simple words, if I make it uh, this way, probably you will get it. If I make a startup as a project, right, and I'm going to run this project, which is a Windows, okay, so we agree that uh, the EXE has an MSIL and it got translated to the machine level instructions and at the end of the day, at the end of the execution point, when I run the application, I want to see a form which has a dialog box which has a boundary. If you see there is a line here, this whole box is there. I can able to hold this and drag it here. Okay, when I maximize this, again, so this these are the basic uh, things. Who is doing all this stuff? Like, I just wrote a code, but at the end, your operating system is executing those instructions, right? So the operating system level, you can actually control what so even this menu, whatever appeared on a click of this, is controlled by the operating system. So that's a standard Windows uh, behavior, um, or drawing down this box and uh, setting its color to show up on your screen based on your screen settings or based on your screen resolution or color settings and whatnot. So all those is pretty pretty much directly interfere with the hardware of your operating uh, hardware of your machine and uh, show you the uh, image or objects that you are seeing and playing with. So that's the level of uh, things if you want to utilize, you can utilize directly invoking the respective uh, APIs of the windows. Okay, in simple words, uh, if I want to, you know, draw a hole uh, on this form, Okay, for example, I have this form. I want to have a big hole here so that I want to see what is uh, behind this form. I can do that using my Windows API tool, API, API functions, because it is the API functions that draws you the uh, box and also make this mouse work. When I click on this and drag it, it is made possible by the operating system. So all those things you can actually control directly um, uh, using the Windows APIs and pretty much your uh, machine level instructions have that level of instructions to the operating system uh, to perform what it is doing. Um, so saying that, where am I? So pretty much uh, your verification process uh, is going to uh, verify uh, that your code is not doing uh, or not trying to access uh, outside what it is what it should do pretty much an example is trying to if you're trying to access a windows api functions directly uh, it will say you you're doing something wrong you're doing an unsafe uh, code so that is not your job to do that is uh, what a clr job to do so if you want something you tell me what to do i will execute it Okay, so if you're trying to do something beyond uh, the CLR scope, um, not uh, yeah, beyond the CLR control, then it becomes an unmanaged or sort of unsafe code. Uh, a typical example is uh, accessing a Windows API uh, directly or accessing the memory area. So wherein I can specify, okay, you're going to put this uh, value into this address uh, because you might have to do that in certain cases wherein uh, uh, for example, the COM component is there and the COM is going to run its own memory area and your application is running its own memory area. Both are isolated to one another. So one cannot uh, read the memory of the other area, which we discussed in the application domain of what it is. So every application domain has its own isolated memory area, uh, which will be used only by that, applica up that application process. So if you're trying to uh, reach out the address outside your uh, uh, your application domain, that becomes in, that also needed in some cases, which is called an out of process 
uh, invocation or it's a remoting in other words so when you do a remoting you need to call the methods of the respective process area outside your application domain uh, that becomes again a uh, remoting concept wherein we have even seen that in attached to process uh, in one of the debugging uh, sessions wherein the IDE is running on one process area where the application is running in a different process area uh, where I attach the out of process to enable my debugging so situations like that uh, might require you to do an unsafe code wherein you take control of uh, the memory area, uh, memory management area or the Windows APIs which normally you don't need to. So whenever you write a code like that in managed code, uh, compiler is going to uh, fail your code verification. So it's going to simply say, it's going to raise an ex exception saying uh, your uh, system.security.verifier exception wherein it, it it simply says you're writing an unsafe code you cannot do this in managed code so but you need to write that code because we have discussed the scenarios where you have to do sometimes uh, to invoke a remoting or write uh, access some address area or a couple of windows apis uh, will require um, the uh, pointers or the address area of your application uh, for example, a typical example I just uh, told you uh, that uh, if I want to uh, like make this form transparent or I have a big hole within this so I can have to use a direct X API so that are, are uh, on the Windows operating system. So I'll make a Windows operating system a call uh, saying okay we draw a big hole here on my form. So how will I say? I have to pass the handle to this form because it's within the Windows environment it has so many other forms right so which form it's going to do it so we have to specify which form so I have to pass the handle of this form to the API to draw a hole so that handle is nothing but the address of the form, the form in the execution uh, memory side the, so you're passing that address to the API that means you're actually giving a control of the address area of within your process to hand someone outside the process area okay so this is again an unsafe code so that means uh, hope you're clear so that is what an unsafe code is if you're trying to play with the memory area or trying to manually handle the memory area or giving a handle to a memory area to someone else uh, who are not trustworthy that means in CLR terms who are unmanaged code uh, things like that becomes unsafe code so this is a, a typical example so the code verification process uh, one of the step it does is it checks that no memory is read from without having previously been written to okay as simple as that so how will you ensure that this particular address in the memory um, is uh, 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 is used uh, without uh, uh, your control it simply determines that if in the execution process if I created this uh, memory address then I will read it otherwise no okay as simple as that so this typical code sample mapping to the memory area uh, again this is the memory area I just uh, put a small uh, um, slide demonstrating both heap and stack okay and what is heap and what is stack uh, don't worry uh, for now just remember that stack is a uh, memory area if you know the data structures um, so if you know the data structures are the mother of the memory management um, wherein these stacks, queues, heaps, everything uh, comes into play. So if you are completely new to uh, data structures, I would recommend you to go and refresh the data structures fundamentals uh, before we get into the next sessions, uh, wherein the, uh, the heap and stack becomes a very core concepts uh, in managing the data types. 
um, we have a value reference and, uh, uh, um, value types and the reference types and this is a distinction uh, between a value type so all the value types are, are stored in the stack and the, all the reference types are stored in the heap so uh, that's a little overview here we'll see more in the forthcoming sessions so at this stage so uh, this memory area this uh, line of code says that it's created in, uh, instance of a string uh, underscore PTR as a global variable here and I stored a value to it. So the PTR uh, is an identifier to the address. Okay, so when it's created a PTR into the memory, it's going to create an address space for it. In this case, because this is a reference type, it straight away goes into the heap and create the uh, or assign a available address to the PTR. So PTR now is actually referring to the address, not the value. Okay, although this statement says PTR is equal to global, so PTR refers to the address and the value is stored inside that address. Okay, global. If you go one step deep into that, uh, we have even seen uh, the size of the uh, each uh, a cache hit will actually retrieve four uh, bytes of data. So that four bytes of data in one read, it can read. So that four bytes of data is named as a page. So that's again a uh, one step down. Okay, so we'll uh, keep our uh, scope limited. So this value is created in a heap at the address location called 100001, just, a, just to give a name, okay? And the value is stored within that address space. And now, in the next following statement, I'm reading that value here. So what I'm going to do is, when I say, okay, write line, and I'm passing the variable. When I'm passing the variable, the instruction that goes to the operating system is nothing but the address of the memory area. And what the instruction followed, it will be, okay, get me the value from this address and show it here. Okay, it's pretty simple. So it's going to read the value in this address and show it here. So what these two statements did here is, the one statement is actually assigned an address area, the other statement is actually retrieve the value. It's pretty much save and retrieve. Okay, it's a very simple uh, uh, scenario here. So the code verification checks that whenever you're reading a value, okay, so this value, who created this value? Is it me? Oh yes, it's me. Oh, I'm done. You, you pass. You're done. What if you're trying to pass an address that is not created by your code? Then it becomes an unsafe. So it declares that, okay, you're trying to read a memory area which I have not created for you. So you are not allowed to do that. So hence, I declare you an unsafe code. So that's as simple as possible, okay? And similarly, the same pattern goes with the value type wherein i is equal to 10, it creates a um, address in the stack um, and saves the value. So it's pretty much, if you say it's address and value, address and value is the same in heap and stack. Only thing difference is how the steep is, um, how the uh, stack is managed, how the heap is managed makes a big difference, okay? So if you see the data structures uh, in detail, then you will see how the stack operates and how the heap operates. Uh, then you will have more idea. Otherwise, uh, the memory is again have, it will have an address and a value to store there. So in here, the int uh, has a address and it's uh, saved the value in the first instance and the other time when I'm calling it to read out, it's going to read out because in this case, it saved, the, it created this address and saved the value and you are reading it. So this declares safe code. So code verification passed and you're done. So that's the code verification process wherein it checks uh, that your code is safe. Okay, now this is a typical example of an unsafe code. Okay, so now you might wonder how will I know the address before a reading? So because here in the plain .NET code, no way you can actually uh, refer to an address which 
by itself, right? You cannot actually refer to an address because you don't know where this address is uh, because a normal uh, C sharp code or .NET code uh, will not actually provide you those features. But the legacy code does and which is the concept called a pointers. Uh, in earlier sessions we just hinted on what is a pointer and C sharp stopped supporting um, C sharp or, or .NET doesn't support pointers anymore um, but you can still write uh, code using pointers and how this is how you can write a pointers if you have a, a C or C++ background then you will uh, easily identify this line of statements and the syntax um, so this is uh, pretty much uh, a variable I data is a variable that I have created and uh, in the next statement I'm actually uh, getting the address of the memory area of iData. In simple terms, if you see this slide, PTR has an address and the global is stored in that address. So, but here I have, I can read only the value from that address, but I actually can't read the address of that address, okay? I cannot actually see 10001 so that to say okay this is the address in other words in the other example when I said it would draw a hole in my form I have to send the handle to my, of my form to the Windows operating system um, so in that case uh, the address is nothing but my Windows handle uh, and to have a handle of that you need to actually read the address and then pass the address which is done by using pointers in the older languages, which are C++, C++, uh, C languages. And we, you can still write the same code here. So int star p data is equal to uh, ampersand, ampersand represents the address of i data. So if you see address of i data, that's how you read. So int pointer p data, this is a new data type <coughs> of type pointer. Uh, integer pointer and it is referring to the address of i data and what it's trying to do is it is actually reading the address areas so you're actually trying to read an address uh, and that becomes an unsafe code because you're actually trying to manage the address by your own <coughs> and uh, .NET simply says okay this is an unsafe context we can have a quick demo because I, I have uh, code written and kept it ready. Uh, I just named it as an unsafe code. Okay, so this is the unsafe uh, uh, keyword that goes along with it. And what will happen if I remove this? So .NET simply says this is an unsafe <coughs> code. So pointers and fixed size buffers uh, may only be used in an unsafe code. This is a concept of uh, handling your memory by itself. Okay, and uh, to make it a valid code, I'll just put decorate my uh, method with an unsafe keyword. You can apply the unsafe keyword at the member level or a variable level or a class level. You can apply it uh, at any level and make your entire code uh, safe. And this way, I can see what uh, the address of an I data is okay so let's see it's pretty interesting that again I um, uh, I have declared a variable and I want I'm in the next step I'm actually reading the address the memory address uh, in the next statement uh, so the pretty much the first statement shows me the I data value which is 10 and the second the address is uh, uh, int I'm typecasting it to int uh, to p data okay typecast we haven't seen so far uh, don't worry we will cover it in detail for the now what I'm doing is p data is a is of type pointer, and I'm actually converting that to integer data type because the address is an integer number. Okay, I'm going to run this. I'm going to start up this project, and uh, to make it simple, I'm going to take this away, and we'll have only this code, which is calling the unsafe code and uh, calling the member called pointer demo which is going to uh, do this block of code. So what I see what I see here is the value of a data which is 10 and the address of this data is uh, 49413352. 
okay so this is pretty much an integer value of an address so I'm trying to manipulate the uh, I'm trying to read the address and I can actually do anything with that address location if I have right I can even manipulate that address using some algorithm or pass this address to the out of process area where in a, another com component or a windows api can ho can take a control of that uh, address uh, space and uh, do manipulation on that so you are actually uh, giving a control to someone else by passing the address directly so this is an unsafe code but now remember this is still a managed code because this is still a .NET and if you compile it you will still get the MSIL nothing has changed except that this is an unsafe code so uh, in order to pass the verification process you have to make this code a unsafe code by not my notifying the uh, the just in time compiler uh, I, this is this block is unsafe it's going to skip the verif code verification process on this block and will continue uh, and will pass the code for execution so saying that so as i mentioned methods and types and code blocks can be defined as unsafe and of course using unsafe code introduces security and stability risks and yes, this is what we have seen just now, a demo of how the uh, main called pointer demo and the pointer demo uh, read the value and the address in that value. And when can you use the unsafe code? As I mentioned, uh, when we, whenever you're trying to access the Windows 32 APIs or the, um, in other words, sometimes some scenarios suggest uh, uh, that using uh, unsafe code that is playing around with the memory uh, if at all you, you're really sure uh, you can actually bypass a couple of uh, CLR operations and um, uh, increase the performance of your code uh, which is a very high level .NET programming uh, which we really don't want to go there um, and uh, uh, so for now we are good with unsafe code and uh, yes, this is the tool, PE Verify tool, which I've been talking about uh, uh, to ensure that if you write your own compiler to verify the MSIL that your compiler has emitted uh, is a error-free MSIL code, you use the PE Verify tool to check that. So in the market, as I mentioned, there are so many other compilers available like, you know, uh, uh, Python, uh, Ruby, uh, or even um, uh, the Cobol.net, uh, so on. So every, every one is actually adding their own language to .NET so that they can make use of the um, uh, applications running in the .NET to leverage the uh, various advantages available. Um, so they have to write their own compilers and they use the PE Verify tool to check uh, if their compiler output uh, is, uh, is error free for CLR to run. Um, so this is a pretty much available with your SDK uh, as I have been telling you um, if you have an uh, PE, uh, for example, PE Verify. P verify and hit a question mark then you'll see the command line options that are available uh, verify only the PE structure and IL so once you have a couple of uh, command line uh, I'm definitely sure you will never use this tool uh, unless you're, uh, you you intend to write your own uh, tool or you can use this tool again uh, when uh, for example um, you get into a project and you see you're, you're actually using a third party language completely a COBOL.NET you're actually upgrading a COBOL or integrating your uh, .NET modules with the COBOL programs uh, and uh, you are in a situation that you're using a COBOL.NET compilers okay and those compilers were given by the third party guys not by the Microsoft or even if you see even if you want to verify Microsoft compilers are emitting the valid MSIL you can actually use the PE Verify tool. Uh, in that case what you're going to do is you, your, your CLR is complaining something your COBOL.NET compiler compile the code but you 
CLR is not able to execute it properly, you will have a situation wherein you will say, uh, you, because you did wrong, this is not happening, or Microsoft did something wrong and it's not working, or Microsoft is not supporting the cobol.net and things like that. You'll get into an argument saying who is who, who did what and all, okay? Uh, becomes a big, very big ball game. So in those situations, uh, this tool is an ideal tool. What Microsoft says, if P verify passed your code, passed your MSIL code, that means CLR is good. CLR will execute your program, no doubt about it. So as simple as that. So you you use your COBOL language and write your code and use the, uh, it emits the MSIL code and to verify if it is MSIL is valid or not, you will use this tool, uh, PE Verify, and ensure that PE Verify pass that code successfully. To that's a, a benchmark saying that yes, your tool works good, your MSL is valid. Okay, and similarly, ILASM is an assembler which is also available. We have seen uh, IL disassembler, uh, where an IL assembler where is a tool that is used to uh, compile your assembly. Uh, compile your MSIL and the metadata to a uh, DLL. So this is a pretty much options. We have DLL, EXC, PDB, and debug information, other things. So this is a tool that is used to generate all those files and pretty much your ID will use these tools. And uh, if you see the delay signing uh, and other things or the uh, signing uh, features, well, they're all an integral part of the uh, uh, ILA, ILASM. Um, where is the key? Yeah, the, here is the key where in which is uh, going to be used for strong name or strong signature here. Okay, uh, at the compiler internally you're going to use this uh, tool for uh, creating the assemblies. And uh, this is almost end of it and the last part is the app domain. So this is interesting. Now um, the app domain is a very 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 interesting point. So if you come, if you, if you observe what code verification does, it is ensuring that the address area that you have created only you can read. Okay, that ensures that uh, the assembly or your assembly is going to read or use only the address that is created by its process. So that ensures a isolation okay <clears throat> when we see the normal uh, dot, uh, windows applications the application process area the normal in, th in terms of process they have a dedicated memory area located uh, which is isolated from any other process area so saying that one process uh, will not ever read the address of other process area unless explicitly said which is remoting which is different topic so they have their control over the address or the memory that was allocated for each application to run with. So because of uh, .NET code verification process, your application is uh, guaranteed that uh, your app, which in other words, is called an application domain. So the process area is also called as an application domain, but it's, there's a slight difference, which we'll see. So the application domain, uh, within which the, your application runs, which your dot .NET application runs, uh, will ensure that the address that is used by this application domain is isolated from any other application domain or any other process area, okay, which we have seen. So no, no doubt about that. So saying that, is that possible for you to have a multiple application domains within the same process area? Yes, it is. So, which is a robust uh, um, robustness of the .NET application is achieved because of that. So, I will say .NET applications are robust because they have a code verification process within which it ensures uh, the safety of the code, which internally gives the uh, isolation of the application execution within the application domain. So application domain, if you see in the process as a definition, we have uh, referred to it as an isolated memory area within which an application runs its code. 
the same definition is stands good at the application domain. So in other words, when the Windows process creates a process area for your application to run, you can actually run any number of application domains within the process area. So that's a big difference. So any normal applications can run only one instance of the application in one process area. For .NET applications, you can actually run multiple uh, instances of that application within the process area uh, of the operating system. So how good it is, how advantageous it is, it is if you see uh, a multi-threaded application, so multi-process application, it's more to a multi-process application, not the multi-threaded application, wherein um, you can actually uh, have several instances of your application running within the same limited resources that are allocated uh, for your uh, process area. Um, so the pr process uh, creation is an operating system job which is instantiated, uh, which is kicked off by the CLR. So the process creation has its own uh, resources uh, uh, operations wherein it tries to isolate a certain amount of memory area for this process area. So once that is done, um, you can actually have multiple ap uh, application domains executed parallelly uh, within the process area. So that gives you a lot of uh, scope and which way we will see in the next slide. If you see the Windows .NET applications uh, within the app domain, uh, in other words, this app domain refers to the uh, process area uh, in the Windows process area, in other words. So normally a process, uh, if it is an unmanaged Windows application, so the process, uh, this diagram is not very detailed, okay, don't worry, uh, probably next time I'll make it detailed. So within the process, you can have a number of threads. So that's a unit of execution. So the process will have the uh, dedicated memory area within which the application can run. And within the process area, you can, by minimal, you will have one thread. Uh, so you, for any application in your uh, operating system to run, by minimal, it should have one process and one thread to execute. And if you have multiple threads, uh, so thread is another. And again, if you're not new, if you're new to thread, a thread is a uh, uh, so is a method of execution or or the path of execution. If you say one method, uh, for example, show me show the name or show get me that in our example. That method is actually running in the same thread when we when normal in our code examples. So if I want to make that method execute parallelly or concurrently, uh, uh, then I will use a threading concept. So two instances of the same method, if you want to run parallelly concurrently at the same time, so that it can handle two requests simultaneously. So then I'll then I have to write a multi-threaded application wherein. Uh, I will have to tie up this method, uh, which is a path of execution. The method is another word called the path of execution. Uh, a path of execution is referred to as a thread. So this thread uh, will have this path of execution and I can have multiple instances of that thread to make it a multi-threaded application. So uh, the same method can run multiple instances parallelly to have to have a more responsive time. So if multiple users are hitting the same instance, so different threads can handle each of their uh, uh, requests and process it simultaneously, which will give you the uh, performance of the application or latency time go down. So that's how the multi-threaded multi applications work. And multi-process are where the same application uh, is hosted on a different process uh, and you have a multi-threaded. So when it's going to go to the large scale applications, um, you go into, you can instance, uh, this is especially uh, useful when you do the web applications, wherein uh, the web applications load, or a client server applications, wherein the server uh, will be hit by several clients um, within the network. So it, it will be the number of clients who hit the server will drastically go up when it is a, um, web-based applications. So in those scenarios, it really makes a big difference. Um, and uh, this is an unmanaged Windows application. It's a process within that you have a thread. 
when it comes to .NET managed code, you can actually have a, a separate domain within the uh, app domain. Uh, application domain is pretty much six in the process area. So within that, you can have a separate application domain and, and multiple instances of the same application running here. And within the applications, this is pretty much referred to a process at this level. So the application domain um, uh, is pretty much maps to the process that we have here. So think about the scalability-wise, how, how big uh, robustness uh, this can create. Um, so this is pretty much the topic called the web garden. Uh, if you ever heard that term, a web garden is uh, possible uh, for ASP.NET applications, wherein uh, you will use the same server worker process area to host multiple instances of the same web application, so that uh, each instance can re respond to the user request. Uh, and handle uh, multi, similarly refers to a multi-process applications uh, and multi-process area that is achieved within the same process area using a multiple app domain. Um, so we, this is going to consume less resources in the uh, in your server side and will give you a high responsive time uh, for your web-based web applications. And okay, web garden is one of the thing where you have multiple app domains or process area within the server. Uh, the next higher version is the uh, web uh, web farm, wherein uh, you have multiple physical servers uh, sitting together uh, and have a load balancer which switch the request from one application to other application. Uh, which is far away topic for now, uh, which we'll have uh, probably uh, when we have the web application demo and the end of our training. And that takes our session to the end. Okay, in this session we did walk through the uh, internals of CLR execution. We did also walk through the CLI, uh, the common language infrastructure, how the various the language specific compilers uh, run and uh, some of the overview we did walk through and also we did see a managed assembly what are the different parts uh, you will find in a managed assembly which is uh, to metadata and MSIL or CIL in, ge in general uh, combined to form a uh, managed assembly which is in real term it's DLL or an exe file. And also we did see the ILASM, Intermediate Language Assembler, and of course the comparison to the ILDASM tools. Uh, and we did also uh, demonstrate once again on the ILDASM what it is capable of doing and how can we uh, do the, uh, or analyze the Intermediate Language using the ILDASM tool. And also we did see the what is a code obfuscation and, uh, and and how it helps in uh, uh, securing the, the firm specific uh, intellectual properties uh, which is your source code in general. And uh, various different tools available, uh, third-party tools available in the market. We will see the whole list uh, for code obfuscation. And uh, we will see the J J JIT compilers uh, just in time and how they run and what is the life cycle and uh, what are the steps involved. And CLR implicitly invokes JIT as and when it is required. And we did see the control, complete workflow of the how the JIT normally works. And, uh, and this is again a uh, JIT compiler internals we did walk through and we did also see a types of JIT compilers which is the pre-JIT, a corner JIT, a normal JIT. And we did see what is a code verification and also uh, unsafe code we did walk through a very nice demo and we did see uh, this is all about unsafe code and when we can use the unsafe code and we did see a p verify tool and how can we use it in general and uh, finally we did walk through the app domain okay so, and we did walk through the lot of different parts of the app domain so that's uh, taken care in this session and we'll continue with our next topics in the subsequent session.